Okay, so uh, this week, <laughs> thanks, Jerry. Um, this week, uh, we are excited to have Anton Bernstein from Georgia Tech uh, talking about counting colorings of triangle free graphs. And uh, this talk will be on the board. So ho hopefully, this is legible. <laughs> that was our main goal. Uh, and uh, I will be trying to monitor chat. So if you have questions and you would like to type them in, I can try to relate them for you. Hmm. But uh, other than that, uh, let's uh, or, or take us away, Anton. <laughs> thank you, Steven. Thank you, everybody, for coming and for joining. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for doing such a tremendous work on setting all of this fancy new technology up. I hope that this, this, this goes well. And you cannot imagine how much of a pleasure it is to give a real live board talk to a real live audience. But you know, I might be a bit rusty, so you know, uh, don't don't judge me too harshly. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about coloring, counting colorings of triangle-free graphs, and uh, all of this is uh, joint work with uh, Tyler Brazelton, uh, Rui Jacao, and Aiken Khan from Georgia Tech, the students at Georgia Tech. Uh, so uh, what's the general setup that we work with? We have a graph G, which is going to be triangle-free throughout the talk. Say this now, and I might forget to mention this again, but it's always triangle free. Delta is going to stay for the stand for the maximum degree of G. Um, also, N is going to be the number of vertices, and M the number of edges in G. And what we are interested in is, is coloring G with uh, as few colors as possible. Um, which is, I guess, the question of what is uh, the best upper bound in the chromatic number of such a graph we can get is, 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 is a classical, classical question. There is sort of a, what we know is that there is a lower bound that's impossible to beat. It could be at least, let me say it this way, uh, one half, maybe plus some lower order term uh, uh, times delta over log delta. Um, this is, uh, Dieter Friesen Wuchak uh, from 92. Uh, so so, so they, they actually got the constant right. Uh, there, there are early results from late 70s, early 80s by Bolobash and uh, Kostichko and Mazarov independently, who showed that at least there is a constant you can put here. So the order of magnitude is at least delta over log delta. But actually, we get one half here. How do we prove this? By looking at random uh, delta regular graphs. That's, that's the bound for those. Uh, on the other hand, it turns out that this order of magnitude actually is, uh, is best possible. Uh, Johansson famously showed in 96 that actually for any such triangle free graph, the chromatic number is big O of delta over log delta. So this is mostly constant times delta over log delta for some value of the constant, which is not one half, but some, some, something independent of delta. Uh, it's actually, this is this, this is this kind of a curious paper. It's never has been published and it's impossible to find. And different sources cite different constant factors here. So we don't actually know what the constant was uh, in Johansson's proof. But in any case, it was some, some value, maybe around 10 or something like this, which has been slowly improved over time uh, until very recently, Mike Malloy in 2019 uh, in a breakthrough paper actually argued that he can reduce the constant all the way down to one. And this is this is the best possible, best known, uh, currently known bound. Uh, so this was a remarkable result for several reasons. Why is that the methods used in Johansson's original proof could not really be, you know, they have had been pushed to their limit before, and you cannot reduce the constant all the way to one there. Uh, another thing is that there is still a gap of a factor of two between these constants, but uh, we don't even know that these graphs, triangle-free graphs, have large enough independent sets to be colored with fewer than this many colors. And even already proving that the independence number is large enough would be a, a tremendous breakthrough. It would improve bounds on off diagonal Ramsey numbers and all, all, all other stuff. So somehow this really is matches the best that we can kind of hope for with our current understanding of the universe. Um, okay, so this, this, this result is the starting point of our investigation. Uh, what we want to study is the number of calories. Now, if we know that, that the chromatic number is less than this much, so there is at least one coloring with this many colors, well, can we argue that there are many rather than just, just one? Uh, so let me introduce this notation. Um, put it here. C of G comma Q. This is going to be the number of colorings of G using Q colors. Number of proper Q colorings 
of G. And so the main, the main result I want to talk about today is the lower bound of this quantity for triangle free graphs G in the regime where Q is at least this much. So we know that at least one Kalin is this by Malloy's theorem. Before I state our result, uh, let me give you some intuition for where the band comes from. The band turns out to be sort of what you would kind of naively guess the answer should be. Uh, so what is the naive calculation? Well, imagine just coloring every vertex randomly. So there, there's a set of Q colors, you give us a, a random color to each vertex. So maybe F is a random Q coloring. Uh, then asking how many proper colorings there are is the same as asking what's the probability that the random coloring is, is proper. Now, if I take two vertices, say U and V, that are adjacent in my graph, uh, what's the probability that they are colored differently in F? Well, each of them is colored randomly is one of the Q colors. So this probability is equal to one minus one over Q. There's only one over Q probability that they get the same color. Uh, this is true for every edge. So if, uh, if these events for different edges happen to be independent from each other, we could just take a product and see what the probability is, right? So if these events uh, are independent for all the edges, for all edges, then the probability that F is proper would be exactly equal to one minus one over Q raised to the power of however many edges we have. So M, and this is the same as to say that the number is equivalent to saying that the number of Q colorings is equal to one minus one over Q to the power M times Q to the N, because this is how many total colorings we have, right? Uh, okay, well, this relies on this weird assumption that these events are independent and they're in general not independent. In fact, they would only be independent if the graph has no cycles because any cycle has, has a dependency here. So true only if uh, there are no cycles. Um, yeah, so, so in that case, the, calcul the calculation is exact, but that's not what we, we want to worry about. Um, on the other hand, if you think about this a bit, uh, even if they're not independent, if, if you go, if you take an even cycle, then these events are going to be correlated positively. The probability that they all happen at the same time would be actually higher than the product of the probabilities rather than lower. Somehow even cycles seem to only help us. And uh, this intuition is justified by this theorem of, uh, uh, I want to say Chikvari, but I'm not 100% sure I'm pronouncing this correctly. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, well, who argued, uh, uh, that uh, this, this, this is a lower bound if the graph is bipartite. If there are no odd cycles, all cycles are even, then this is a lower bound. So this is a lower bound. Bipartite. And what we argue is that, well, if you don't forbid all odd cycles, just the shortest ones, the triangles, uh, then this isn't quite the lower bound, but we can get a bound that's pretty close. Um, so here's our, here's the main theorem of today's talk. Um, I guess, how I want to say this? Uh, let's say for all epsilon greater than zero, uh, if delta is large enough and Q is at least one plus epsilon delta over log delta, then the number of proper Q colorings of G is at least one minus one over Q to the M times one minus a little bit times Q to the N, where this little bit delta, uh, technically what comes out of our proof is something like four, let me write this, some kind of weird expression like this, but the main point is that in the regime where Q is at least one plus epsilon delta over log delta, this, is, uh, this goes to zero as delta goes to infinity. So this is some error term. Think of this as an error term uh, that you can plug in there, in the, uh, except to this error term, the bound is exactly the same. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Um, yeah, so this is the main, I think I should put it in the, the box. This is the main result. Uh, yeah, I should say uh, that really we can prove something stronger, which I will not talk too much about today. 
the same is true for list colorings, for example. If you give every vertex its own list of Q colors and you, color, and you count how many colorings the, with, with the same parameters for Q, you get at least this many colorings from those lists. Um, and if you know what correspondence coloring or DP coloring is, the same holds from that setting as well. If you don't know what that is, don't worry too much. Um, okay. So let me mention a few corollaries for this. Um, um, yeah, so, so this is stated for, for all Q that's at, le at least this much, right? Uh, but in particular, if you take, just use this bound for Q and you plug that in, uh, then you get some, some explicit formula. So using uh, the bound that Q is at least, you know, one plus little one. Those over log delta. And also here there's an explicit dependence on M. So somehow the more the fewer edges you have, the, the better the bound is. Uh, but since the maximum degree is delta, M is certainly at most delta n over two. Uh, and if you plug these two numbers into the formula, you can get something like this is at least e to let me write it this way. Okay, something like this. Uh, up to an error term in the exponent. Okay, whatever this is. Uh, maybe it's not so, so important to know what this formula is, but uh, let me derive a, a corollary of this statement now. Uh, suppose I don't care about the number of colorings, I just want to count independent sets in, in my graph. Well, a Q coloring uh, is just a sequence, you can think of it as just a sequence of Q independent sets that are all disjoint and cover the whole vertex set. Uh, this means that the total number of Q colorings is at most, the number of independent sets raised to the power of Q. Certainly, you know, it's at most what you can get by just taking Q independent sets arbitrarily, right? So now if I raise, you know, if I, if I take Q through to both sides and plug this in, uh, then the, the, I guess, yeah, this, these two statements together will imply that the number of independent sets uh, is at least, again, something. Uh, one minus little of one. Uh, I hope I'm doing this right. Yeah. Okay, something like this. Again, some formula. But I want to point out that this actually this result from independent sets was already known, uh, and we obtain it as you know sort of this simple corollary of our of our calculations. Uh, so this is the theorem of uh, Avis, uh, Jensen, Perkins. And Roberts from 2018, and they obtained this bound using rather rather different different techniques. Uh, and one other thing I should mention that this bound actually is optimal in general. There is no up to the value of this lower the term. This is best possible. But that's what they showed. So we recover this optimal bound on the number of independent sets by just saying, well, you know, look at the number of colorings and and you use this trivial inequality. Um, Actually, well, this bound for independent sets is optimal. This implies that at least in some regimes, our bound on the number of colorings also has to be optimal. Uh, actually, it's optimal for all possible values of Q. So let me say that as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Our bound is optimal up to the value of the error term for all for all q so so for any q and delta uh, there exists a triangle free free delta regular graph g such that uh, the number of q colorings of this graph is at most again some maybe slight slight error term here this most this much. So, so really this naive bound actually cannot be improved and for triangle free graphs it's missing. Um, oh yeah, maybe, maybe some of you can guess how you get the graph G. Uh, random regular graphs. Yeah, this, 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 is, this is true with high probability. This inequality holds for random delta regular. 
graphs and they're triangle free with positive probabilities. This implies that uh, actually most triangle free graphs have this property. Okay. Uh, any questions? Um, all right, so then uh, uh, in the remainder, most of the remainder of the talk, uh, I'd like to sketch the proof of this for you. Uh, this, so this, this, the proof is simple enough that they can explain pretty much most of it in, in this lecture, which is kind of nice. Um, and uh, let me tell you how we came up with this. Uh, so as I mentioned, there is this. There are these results, uh, these bounds on chromatic number of triangle three graphs. The, the the earliest one is due to Johansson, and uh, that proof uses something called the the Nibble method. So don't worry too much about what this is, but it's some kind of standard probabilistic technique where you construct a coloring by you know bit by bit that's what's called the nibble method because you color a few vertices at a time and you use the local lowest local lemma repeatedly to argue that the coloring has the, the properties that you want and this uh, is sufficient to prove a band of the form big o of delta over log delta on the chromatic number but this constant cannot really be reduced below something like four is really the limit for this for this method as it turns out so key contribution of moloi uh, was to use, instead of the snibble technique, use something called the entropy compression method. Uh, and this is a technique that's, uh, that's, been invent that, that's been invented originally to provide an algorithmic proof of the Lovas local lemma, but then it turns out that uh, in many situations you can apply it directly to combinatorial problems to get better results. And this is, this is one of the instances of this. Um, actually, later it turns out turns out that you know if you apply the lowest local lemma or lopsided lowest local lemma in some kind of clever way, then you can avoid the use of entropy compression and still get Molloy's result. But this is again a different argument. Um, so there has been a recent development in the field of understanding things like entropy compression and local lemma. Uh, Matthew Rosenfeld came up uh, just in 2020 with a new counting inductive counting technique. which can serve as an alternative to entropy compression. To entropy compression. Uh, so uh, entropy compression itself was kind of a slightly technical tool to or bulky technique to use. This is a very elementary method that recovers uh, pretty much all of the same results and sometimes gives better results. And one byproduct of this is that it not only proves that something exists, but actually gives you a lower bound on how many of these things there are. Kind of, it comes out of the method directly. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to apply this, uh, this, this idea to the uh, uh, question of coloring triangle free graphs. And somehow out of that, the lower bound of the number of such colorings will come out. Uh, but it's a bit more complicated than just using this. So let me now start to explain how the proof actually goes. Hmm. Yeah, okay, let me raise this. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so let me write this, say here. So we remember that Q is at least one plus epsilon delta over log delta. And I think that delta is very large. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, how does the proof go? Well, all of these arguments, Malloy's and Johansson's proofs, and a lot of other arguments in this area. You don't build the coloring at once. You first find a partial coloring with some kind of nice properties. And then you argue that these properties allow you to extend it to color the rest of the verses. And we're going to do the same thing. So we're first going to focus on partial colorings uh, and then try to extend them to coloring of the whole graph. Partial colorings. Um, so since we're trying to extend this coloring, let me introduce some notation. So imagine F is a partial coloring of G and maybe X is an uncolored vertex. So X is the vertex. And when it's uncolored, I'm going to write that F of X is blank. The color assigned to it is blank. And then we will want to color this vertex somehow, but we want to keep the coloring proper. And since X already has some colored neighbors, we cannot use the same color as used by one of them. So let's write down this notation L sub F of X. This is going to be all the colors that X can use still. Uh, so this is the set of all colors alpha, 
And I'm going to say that my set of all colors is just one for Q for convenience, uh, such that X has no neighbor. Y with F of Y being equal to O. So this means that if I color X, Y alpha, it's not in conflict with any vertices that I colored already. And I want this to be large, right? The more colors there are available for X, the more freedom I have when I color it, that's, that's good for me. Now let me introduce one more piece of notation. Uh, so if I take one of these available colors, I'm going to define this thing with degree sub F of alpha comma X. This is something that's called the color degree. Let me uh, write this and then explain why this is relevant. Uh, this is the number of all neighbors of X, Y, such that first Y is blank. So Y is uncolored and alpha is available to Y. And we count how many of these things there are. Okay, so what, what, is this, what does this say? Well, alpha is an available color for X. So we might consider coloring X with alpha. The problem is that Y is also in color. We'll need to color that. And alpha is available for Y. So we also consider coloring Y with alpha. And it means that X and Y, if they both are colored alpha, there's going to be a conflict between these. So this counts how many of these conflicts there can be involving the color alpha. Right? What, you know, what possible problems we can create by coloring X with alpha. And so this we want to be small. Uh, so we want the, the we want the size of the set to be as large as we can make it, and we want these color degrees to be as small as we can make. It. Right. That's 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 the approach that we take. Uh, so, in fact, let me say that F has a uh, has a flaw at X if. Um, First, uh, f of x is uncolored. Oh, sorry, x is uncolored, so f of x is blank. And either um, uh, the size of this list is small. Let me say it right this way. It's less than L, where L is some parameter. I'm going to write in a second what this is. But this is some fixed numerical parameter that we pick. This is like our desired size of this set. Or, or there is some alpha in LF of X with uh, the color degree greater than some other parameter D. So either the color degree of this is too large or the, there are too few available colors. Let me say that this is bad for us. Uh, where, let me write these parameters right here. Uh, L, we're going to take it to be something like this. Okay, whatever this is, it's some number. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And D is going to be just L over say 25. Uh, the, the parameters, numbers 25 and one half are more or less arbitrary. The point is that D is kind of significantly smaller than L. Um, okay, so that's my definition. And we don't want any of these flaws. We say F is good. If there are no flaws. Okay. So here's a fact. This kind of a standard fact in this whole theory is that once you have a good coloring, you're done. In the sense that, well, if you just want to get to one coloring, if you have a good coloring, partial coloring, you can extend it to coloring of the whole graph. Uh, every good partial coloring can be extended uh, to a coloring of all of G. So you can color all the uncolored vertices without creating any conflicts. Uh, the way you prove it is just, it's just a local lemma, an application of the local lemma. You color every uncolored vertex randomly by picking random data color from the available list of available colors. And uh, okay, you can check that the, the conditions of the local lemma sets. So this is kind of a well-known thing. And that's how all of these proofs, uh, Johansson's proof and Malloy's proof, they both construct a good partial coloring somehow and then extend it to coloring of the whole graph. So our strategy is going to be to count how many of these good partial colorings there are first. And then for each of them to count how many ways there are to extend it to a coloring of the whole graph. And this is going to give us some lower bound on the number of colorings of the graph. Um, okay. So to achieve this, we're going to use a tool that was introduced in Molloy's proof. Uh, we need a slightly sharper version of this, but it's essentially essentially the same. So key tool is some kind of coupon collector like lemma. Okay. 
due to, uh, I want to say, it's, yeah, it's due to Malloy that it came, came up in, in his proof. Uh, let me try to explain what the situation here is. So we want to get rid of all of these flaws. So we look at a color, at a vertex X, has some neighbors. Let's call them Y1, Y2. This is YI. YK, where K is, is at most delta, maybe it has fewer than delta neighbors. And then there is the rest of the graph. Uh, and of course, these neighbors can now have neighbors there as well. Um, but there are no edges between them because the graph is triangle free. That's going to be important. So how can we generate a partial coloring of this whole graph? We're going to do this in two steps. Uh, first, we imagine already having some partial coloring outside of the neighborhood of X, let's call it G. This is some kind of partial coloring here. Now, what happens to these vertices? Well, they have some neighbors that may be colored now. Uh, so they have their own list of available colors. And if I look at the vertex, say yi, which color can this vertex have? Well, it can have uh, any color from its list, this L sub G of yi, I guess, right? These are the colors available to yi now. Or it can also be blank because we're doing partial coloring or blank. And the same is true for each of these vertices. And moreover, because there are no edges between them, these choices are completely independent from each other. Uh, they, cannot you know, they cannot conflict. We can assign to each of these any of the colors from the available list or blank, and this is going to be a perfectly fine partial coloring of this. So if you do this random choice for each of them independently, this generates some kind of new partial coloring of, I'll call it F, which is G here, and then these random choices from the neighborhood. And now we can ask, well, what is now what the available colors for X, and what are the color degrees there? And uh, and the lemma says that if you look at the expected size, how many colors X expects to have available to it? This is pretty large. This is at least this thing, um, as it turns out. Well, K is the degree of X in this picture. Uh, so why am I calling this a collector coupon collector lemma? Uh, it's the standard coupon collector lemma that you learn in the basic probability class, theory class is a special case of this where all of these sets L sub G of YI are just equal to one through K, right? If, if all, every vertex has the, all of the same colors available to it, then what's happening, we're just picking elements from one through K randomly. We pick, uh, sorry, one through Q randomly. We pick K of them and we're asking how many elements are not picked. That's literally what this is. And we're saying that the expected size is, is, is this, which is easy to calculate. What Molloy observed is that no matter what these sets are, actually, whichever subsets you pick here, they still get this lower bound. And by the way, by, by construction, this is, a, this is at least 2L, two, two where L is this parameter there. Um, so in other words, it's, you know, the expected size is like twice larger than what we actually want it to be. This gives us enough room to prove that the probability that there is a flaw x is very small, is, is at most, say, P, which is sorry, some, something exponentially small. Let me say it. negative. Something like this. 500. Yeah, 400. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the point is this is tiny. It, what, again, what does it say? It says that what's the probability first that this size is actually less than half of the expected value, and that happens very rarely. And there's the second condition about the color degrees that also you can show happen if such type is happening. Okay, so this is the lemma that we're going to use. Um, okay, any questions so far? Um, ah, yeah, so I would like to point out this, this lemma really relies on the fact that coloring is partial. For the proof of the lemma, it's crucial that these versus yi are allowed to be blank. You can imagine the extreme case where all of these sets of available colors are just one color for each vertex. If you were not allowing them to be blank, they would have to pick exactly those colors and we would have nothing left for X. But, but uh, now with probability one half, they just stand colors in that situation. That's good. That somehow is, is, is sufficient to get the boundary. All right. So all of this was preliminaries. Now let's actually start the, the argument. Uh, so step one. Well, since we want to understand how many good partial colorings there are, first we're going to just get a lower bound on the total number of partial colorings, good or, or otherwise. Uh, uh, count all partial colorings. And for this, we're going to use this lemma, specifically this 
this part. This, this is going to make an appearance. Uh, so let's say, let's introduce some notation, C sub P of G. This is the set of all partial colorings with Q colors, so Q is fixed now of G. And also for a subset of the vertices, uh, let's say C sub P of U, so P for partial, C sub P of U. This is the set of all partial colors on just U. So everything outside of U is uncolored at this point. Or like, if you like, it's a set of, let me write it this way. It's partial colorings of the subgraph induced on you, okay? Um, so these are, in other words, the partial colorings whose domain is a subset of you. So not everything in you has to be colored because the coloring is partial. And uh, so the lemma, so the key lemma is uh, we want to understand how this, the size of the set changes as we, as we add vertices to you one by one so that we can then use an inductive argument. So you have u subset of the vertices and we have some vertex x that's not in u yet. And let's say k be the, this is the number of neighbors x has in u, then the size of the CP of u plus x, this is my notation for u at the vertex x to it. This is at least this quantity times, um, get this right, yeah, uh, the, the, the usual formula times this. Mm. Well, I'm erasing the definition. Okay. Hopefully, we'll be, <laughs> we'll be able to recover. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so this, no, no, before I say how this is proved, right? Once we have this, just apply this repeatedly. Start with the, you being the empty set. There is one partial coloring there. Nothing is colored, right? Then you start adding vertices one by one. Each time you multiply the quantity by this factor. So, this implies that the, and if you do the calculation, you'll see that the total number of partial colors of G is at least all of these one minus one over Qs raised to these powers exactly add up to one minus one over Q to the power of total number of edges. And these terms, these Qs, you know, each for, for each vertex comes in Q to the end. So you get exactly a bound of the sort that we want for the partial colorings though. So this stuff can still be uncolored. Okay. Does this make sense? Yeah. So proof, or proof sketch at least. How do we prove this? Well, we just apply the, apply this lemma. So let's see. Uh, we want to count colorings on, on u plus x, right? Uh, how do you color u plus x? Well, first color u, then color x, right? So let me write it this way. The sum of our all colorings f of u only. How many ways are there to color x once we fix the coloring on u? Well, x has to have one of the available colors or blank. So it can be uh, the number of colors available to x currently plus one because of the blank. Actually, I don't care about this plus one, so let me just do this. Okay. It's at least this much. Um, okay, so how are we going to deal with this? Uh, well, let's, let's do this in two steps again. Let's say that this is equal to sum over all, let's first color the vertices that are not neighbors of X. So let's remove the neighborhood of X. All right, so take, G. It's, I'm going to try to recreate the picture there, right? I have a G, which is a coloring of everything except for the neighbors of X. Then I need to extend it to the neighborhood. Let's call it F. Let's, let's say EXT of G is the extensions of G to the neighborhood. These are the extensions of G to the neighborhood of X. So we already colored everything except the neighbors. Now we color the neighbors. And now it was the same thing, right? Okay, but now let's look, what does this tell us? So this says that for every particular choice of G, the average of this over a random extension is at least this much, right? Uh, therefore the sum, which is what we're looking at here is at least, uh, so this is the sum over all of these Gs. So if the average is at least that, then the sum is at least one minus one over Q to the K times Q times however many of these colorings have there are. Okay, and I promise I'll fit this in this, in this box. So this is just a constant, doesn't depend on Q. Let's take it out. And what will be left is the sum over all Gs of the number of their extensions, right? So G is a coloring of everything except the neighborhood. And then we count how many ways there are to extend to the neighborhood. This just tells me the sum is just how many colorings of, you know, 
everything outside the neighborhood plus the neighborhood there are, uh, which exactly gives us what we want. Times the number of all the colorings of U. This is exactly the bound that I claim. Ta-da. Okay. Everybody, everybody happy? Yeah, everybody's happy. That's good. <laughs> um, yeah, so see, that's what, that wasn't hard, right? Um, hmm. Okay, so this is okay if I, I, I kind of want to keep this on the board. So this is okay if I raise this temporarily. Um, yeah, we even have a band there, so it's fine. So step two count the good colors. Yeah, so we know this. Let me put this in a little box. Step two, instead of all partial coverings, we're now counting the good ones. So this is the key. This is the key part of the proof now. Good. And remember, good means it's a partial coloring without flaws. So uh, and a floor means that a vertex is uncolored and it has either too few available colors or there is one of the available colors with too high of a color degree. So we want to avoid both of these. And we're going to try to do a similar thing as we did here, right? There was, there was some kind of induction where we we're adding vertices one by one. We're going to do the same thing, but in slightly unexpected way. Uh, somehow the obvious idea would be to say, well, look at, I can do subgraphs and count how many good colorings there are and add vertices one by one. That's not what we're going to do. So, and this is the subtle part of the proof. So let's say C sub G of G, this is a set of all good colorings, good partial colorings. So this is what we want to count. And now I'm going to say that for a subset of the vertices, C sub G of the subset, these are going to be colorings that are good on you. This is the set of all partial colorings of the whole graph G. So these are not only on you, they're also vertices outside of you that may be colored such that F has no flaws at the vertices. Maybe I'll okay. add the vertices X with the second neighborhood of X contained in U. Okay, this is kind of a convoluted definition. So first the set U here doesn't tell us which vertices are colored. It tells us where flaws are allowed to be. The bigger the set U, the fewer flaws we are allowing. Secondly, when forbidding flaws, not only inside of, not for all every vertex that's in U, but only for those vertices that the vertex itself is in U, its neighbors are in U, and their neighbors are in U. In this case, we forbid, 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 forbid the flaw to be there. Why is this defined in this way? The idea is that, so, so the reason why we need to look at the colors of the whole graph, essentially what's happening is that this adjusts the probability distribution in, in some kind of way in the calculation uh, that actually makes the, the proof go through. But this condition here ensures that, okay, so, so we have this coloring, it, something inside of you is colored and something outside. To check whether or not this property holds, I don't need to know what happens outside of you. Because whether or not there is a flow at a vertex is determined by the coloring of this vertex, its neighbors and their neighbors. Right? We need to know the vertex is uncolored. We need to know what its list of available colors is. This is determined by the colors of the neighbors. And we need to know the color degree, which somehow depends on the available list of colors for the neighbors, which is determined by their neighbors. So since if the second neighborhood of X is contained in U, I know whether there is a flow at X or not by only looking at U. It doesn't matter what happens outside. That's why the definition is given in this way. Okay, now we have the lemma. And the lemma says, so, so now the way it's defined, the bigger U is, the smaller the set is, because we're putting more and more constraints. Uh, but we want to say that it doesn't shrink too much as we add vertices to it. So if you have U, a subset of the vertices, and we have X, that's not in U, then the size of CG of U plus X is at least one minus a little bit, and the size of CG of U, where this eta is, Something's very small, and something exponentially small. Something like this, some kind of exponentially small term. So the size shrinks when you add vertices, but only by this tiny factor. Or factor, I guess, that's close to one. Okay. Um. <laughs> and this is where we are going to use this Rosenfeld technique in this, in this step. 
Uh, ah, but first, uh, let's see what happens when you combine the lemma with, with this statement that we already know. This implies that, yeah, how do we do this? Well, again, we need to start with you being the empty set. Now, here's the, what, so, so what is, you know, when you use the empty set, what is set of all colorings that are good on the empty set? These are just all the colorings. The empty set means that there are no restrictions. No, we don't care about what the flaws are. This is the same as, the, as, as, as this for, for G, all the partial colors of G. We have a lower bound on this. Now we do this inductive uh, argument. So this shows that the number of good colors in G is at least one minus eta to the N, one minus one over Q M Q to the N. So we got this little bit of an error term from this, but this is, this is, this is not the bad part. Okay. Yeah, so, so let me start the proof here. Now I'll move to the other board. Uh, yeah, so this is the Rosen Rosenfeld technique. And it's, I mean, it's, you know, I'm trying to advertise this technique, but it's so simple that you might have not noticed where the technique is being used. <laughs> it's, you only realize how simple this is after you compare this to other things that were proved using much more arduous methods. Uh, uh, other results that were proved using much more complicated methods to, to and then you can get them kind of easily from this. So first key idea is that we're going to prove this lemma itself by induction. That's the first thing. Uh, we do induction on the size of U. So, it's, so we're assuming that we already know this for all smaller sets. Um, okay, now here's what we do. We want to understand this quantity. Number of columns good on um, U plus X. I want to compare this to the number of columns that are good on U. Well, let's write it this way. The number of columns that are good on U minus the size of some set F, where what is F? These are colorings that we need to subtract. These are colorings that are good on U, but not on U plus X. This is kind of a triviality uh, as you can write it this way. So now to get the lower bound on this, I need to get an upper bound on this thing. Um, what can I erase? I'm going to keep this. I'll erase everything else. We haven't used this yet. So this, this Chekhov gun is going gonna, is gonna to shoot eventually. Uh, but this I won't need anymore. So let me erase this bit. OK. Um, so how are we going to bound f? Well, first observation is that the size of f is at most, let me write this, and then I'll say why this is true. Okay, what is f sub u here? These are all the colorings in f such that f has a flow at u uh, for, for some given vertex u, and I go over all the vertices in the second neighborhood of x. Why is this the case? Because uh, a coloring in f has to be good, not good on u plus x. So there's got to be something, some flow in it at some vertex whose second neighborhood is entirely contained in u plus x. But the second neighborhood is not contained in u because the coloring was good on u. So it means the vertex has to be a distance at most two from x. So it has to have a flow at some vertex like this. So now we're just going to bound each of these individually. In fact, let me start writing this right away. How many of these we have at most, something like delta squared plus one. And I'm going to be delta squared plus one times you know, something, which is a bound on the size of this set. Um, okay. This is in a very awkward place. <laughs> um, maybe we'll remember this, okay? <laughs> in the group one collector setting, the probability of having a Floyd X is less than P, which is something tiny, okay? Uh, let me maybe at least write the value of P here. So P is P to... There's also this data now. Okay. Yeah. So claim. What's the claim? Ah, the size of a few is at most this thing. So we can bound the size of a few as in terms of these numbers, P and eta times, uh, so P is tiny. And this is, okay, something that's actually going to be close to one. So it's really says that it's a tiny, tiny little fraction of this. Uh, so once we have the claim, let me put it in a little box. If you can prove this, then we plug this in here. We get here, E one minus eta delta. And this you can, you can show is at most, 
somehow because p is so small, it's much more smaller than eta, whatever eta was. Uh, so, 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 so this is just a calculation that for, for large enough delta, this inequality falls. Um, okay. So uh, okay, and then we have this, and we plug it in here, we get exactly the result that we want because we want to get this one minus eta. Uh, so, so the only thing that's left to do is to prove the claim. Well, let's do it. Uh, uh, so, um, how do you want to write this? Oh yeah, it's pretty easy actually. Um, so, so we're going to do a similar thing to, induct, uh, to, the, to the induction that we did before. We're going to color everything except the neighbors of U, and then we're going to color the neighbors of U. Um, so let's say S is the set of all Gs, which are partial colorings of uh, V of G minus the neighbors of U, such that G is good on V of G minus, uh, I guess closed. I want U to be uncolored as well. Something like this, yeah. So, and then the size of f of u is, uh, ah, yeah. And, and so for each of these g, let's say we have this ext g, which are all extensions of g to the neighborhood of u. And let me call it f ext. These are the flawed extensions. So these are extensions that have a flaw at u. Right, so this is again the coupon collector setup. We have everything colored except the neighbors. Then we accept the neighbors and ask what are the colorings where the you have there's a flow at u. Well, by the coupon collector lemma, this ratio, the probability that uh, we get a flaw, which is exactly equal to this ratio, uh, this is at most p as the coupon collector. Uh -huh. And now, 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 now I can write this. So the size of f of u is equal to the sum over all g's in s. Well, I guess it's, it's most sum over all g's in s of this. Yeah, it's at most because there are more conditions. F coloring here has to be good on all of u. We're not even saying this. We're just saying it's good on u on, on yeah. sorry, this would be u. U minus the neighbors. Uh, okay, but in any case, this is at most p times the sum of all of these g's of the number of all extensions, this is by this. And this, well, you, you know, you color everything, then you accept the neighbors, then you color the neighbors. This gives you P times the number of, and the resulting coloring will still be good when U minus the neighborhood. Okay, we get this, but we want to compare it to the color colorings that are good on U. This is where the inductive hypothesis comes into play. We start, you know, we know it's already good on u minus the neighborhood. Now we add all the vertices in the neighborhood. We lose a factor of one minus eta each time by the inductive hypothesis. And <laughs> that's where this one minus eta to the delta comes in. Right, so. By the inductive hypothesis, this is at most p over one minus eta to the delta cgu, which is exactly what you want. That's the question. Okay, so now let me just to, to finish off, let me briefly say what, what happens next. So so far, so this was the kind of the heart of the argument. Uh, we've counted these good colorings, but we're not quite done yet. So first, we need to know how many ways there are to extend a good coloring to a proper, we already know there is at least one, that's a classical result, but we need to, to know how many. So this is step three. Um, use, so we're going to just use the usual lowest local lemma here. Uh, to show that a good coloring G with say K uncolored vertices, vertices can be extended in at least 
something like this, L over two to the power k ways. So what's happening is, well, the lowest local limit is if you color each vertex using, you can color vertex using an available color randomly, then with positive probability, you're going to succeed. You're going to get a proper color of the whole thing. Actually, the lowest local, local limit even tells you a lower bound on the probability. And you can translate it into a counting result and you get something of the sort. Uh, where the, this, this number is greater, the more uncolored vertices you have. This somehow is important. And then there is the last step. Which is, I guess, step four. You know, put everything together, right? Uh, so what's, what's, what's happening is we know, how many, we know lower bound a number of good colorings. We know for each of them a lower bound a number of extensions. The problem is that the same coloring of the whole graph can be an extension of different good colorings. Uh, but so what, what, what we need to do is do some kind of double counting to account for that. Use double counting to obtain the lower bound. Lower bound now on C, G, G. And double counting relies on the fact that this grows with K. So the more uncolored vertices you have, the more extensions there are, which helps. Um, okay, so uh, this is kind of a reasonably standard double counting argument, so I'm not gonna go in there. Um, let me just say that this step is where we get most of the error term. So far, our error is like this eta quantity, which is very tiny. Actually, the main contribution to the error term comes from this step. And it would be interesting to understand if that can be somehow removed or improved. Um, but, uh, uh, I will talk more about it. So thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, we thank our speaker. And uh, <clears throat> are there any questions for Anton? Is it not quite, yeah, it's, it's hard to answer this sort of question. It's, uh, it seems that it is, it, like, it seems that every problem which we know how to approach using entropy compression, so far we can do, you know, we, we, can, we can frame it as a Rosenfeld counting argument as well. Although in this case, somehow, you know, the argument has to be somewhat, as, as I explained, somewhat subtle, like this definition of these, you know, these inductive sets is a bit, uh, is a bit unusual. And uh, there was, there's a recent paper by, uh, uh, by, uh, that appears, appeared on the archive uh, a couple of days after ours did, uh, by these two authors, where they also use Rosenfeld method to reprove Molloy's theorem. So to get an upper bound on the, uh, on the chromatic number. Uh, but they do it differently again. So it seems that somehow there's no, you cannot just sit down and like translate the proof in the Rosenthal stuff. So we had to do this, this weird thing where we define the coloring being good on you in this complicated way. And their analysis is like, they don't even talk about good colorings at all. They somehow, you know, do a different sort of thing. But it seems that even in this situation, still we can get the same result if we, if we think of it. <laughs> and there are other situations where translation is more straightforward, but. Yeah, it's not 100% clear how you would formal. I, I, the main problem with this study was the question is it's unclear how you would formalize what it means to have an entropy compression style argument. Uh, yeah, depending on how you interpret it, the answer is uh, probably yes. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, by the way, yeah, 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 right. I didn't do these two steps, but already I essentially proved to you that at least there is one coloring because right? <laughs> because it's kind of a standard local level application. And these two steps are pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm just trying to sell the Rosenfeld method. It's, 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 it's so easy. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions for Anton? Thank you. And uh, thank you for those of you who attended on Zoom. Um, I hope that was sort of legible. Um, I know, uh, I think uh, <laughs> Jerry says, thanks for sharing the, this excellent talk via Zoom. So I hope that <laughs> it was uh, you know, mostly legible. So thanks everyone.